Okay, we've dealt with the geometric properties of film. Uh, and now we're going to deal with the, the spectral properties. So here we have um, um, a figure showing how um, film is exposed for uh, a simple case of here at the bottom, you'll see a, a non-turbid ocean um, where most of the incident radiation is absorbed and a sandy beach adjacent to it that reflects um, you know, most of the incident radiation. And so um, you have incident light, and then moving up one step, you have little radiant flux leaving the scene for the turbid, non-turbid ocean, and lots of radiant flux leaving the scene for the sandy beach that passes through the lens. Um, this then exposes the silver halide crystals that are trapped within the emulsion of the film. Um, so on the left, um, you have um, the crystals are, are exposed, but the image is latent because it requires developing to actually change the color of the silver halide. Um, so on the left, um, you have uh, light has come in and modified those silver halide crystals. On the right, it hasn't because there just isn't a lot of energy leaving the scene and incident upon it. And then um, after you've gone through the development process, um, what you'll see is that the latent image is, um, is revealed. So on the left, you're going to have dark crystals. On the right, you'll have light crystals. And so this is a negative. So the area that is, uh, was ocean water that was dark is now bright. And the area that um, is bright is now dark. And so that's why it's a negative. And then you make a print from that and reverse um, the process to come up with a positive image. Here are two um, what we call black and white images or grayscale images. One is on the left, panchromatic image, so all of the visible. Um, uh, light has been recorded as a single image. And on the right, there's a black and white infrared image that is just showing you the brightness in um, between 700 nanometers and 900 nanometers. <coughs> you may remember that I, I defined the, photo, the photographic infrared um, as between 700 and 900 nanometers, uh, because that's what can be picked up on film. So um, on the left, you know, as we look at the differences between this uh, black and white infrared, um, the vegetation on that little island is brighter. Uh, the marshes, the vegetation um, is, you know, the marshes are the area to the right of the image. That's also brighter. Um, in the, the panchromatic visible on the left, you can see more details of um, um, of water courses, okay? Um, that's because black and white infrared is absorbed um, uh, by water, and therefore you have higher contrast between the water and adjacent areas. So in some cases that's good because for instance, some of those low marshes you can see with greater clarity, um, but you can't see um, where, for instance, um, uh, suspended solids are in the water column. It's no longer there. <clears throat> Again, we've seen these two photos before. Um, at the top, it's a, a panchromatic image. Um, at the bottom, image is black and white infrared. And I just want to um, do a comparison. The advantages of the panchromatic film is it represents brightness in a way that's similar to the human visual system. There's more detail in areas covered by shadow. Um, there's usually better uh, spatial resolution than black and white infrared film, and there's better penetration of water. Um, the advantage of the black and white infrared is that there's better penetration of haze. It emphasizes wet and moist areas, 
So black and white infrared has been used for mapping wetlands, for instance. There's good differentiation between hardwood and conifer areas, and it can detect stressed and dead vegetation. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. And I just want to show you, though, um, that good differentiation between hardwood and conifer. Um, so hardwood would be broadleaf, conifers, needle leaf. And I want to show you the relationship between the signatures for that deciduous or broadleaf and coniferous on um, a map of wavelength versus reflectance. And because there is that distinction, you can see it in the image. So we often go back and forth between a spectral signature and how things look in the image. Um, color film has three layers of emulsion, which record red, green, and blue light. Uh, and so there's a color image of that same Tivoli Bay that we looked at before. Um, two kinds of color images. Uh, one is that normal color, color as we see it, and then false color infrared, okay? And false color infrared, if we look at the figure in the upper right, we see four colors that are incident on the film, blue light, green light, red light, and near infrared light, okay? On color film, blue is recorded as blue, green is recorded as green, and red is recorded as red. So we get true color. Color infrared film is set up in such a way that green light is recorded as blue, red light is recorded as green, and near infrared light is recorded as red. So the first thing you notice with a false color infrared image is that um, vegetation shows up as red because um, the uh, vegetation is very bright in the near infrared and therefore the, the image is going to be red in areas where there's vegetation. And um, one thing about false color infrared is you can see distinctions uh, between um, areas uh, of varying vegetation, uh, particularly like within that marsh area, uh, show up better than they would um, in a color image. And the distinction between uh, some of the areas with drainage features and areas without them also come up better. Um, and bright areas um, in the visible show up as cyan. Um, and that's because those areas are bright in green and red in the real world um, and therefore show up as blue and green um, in a false color infrared or color infrared image. And so blue and green together make cyan. And here's a table that just gives you a, a notion of what objects show up as certain colors in normal color and color infrared. And it probably makes sense to go through and, and make sure that you understand why um, certain normal colors are associated with certain color infrared colors. Um, advantages of color infrared film, um, it shows the presence of vegetation uh, easily. Here on the, the left, these are two images of a portion of a campus. Um, on the left, we have color infrared. On the right, we have color. And you can see it's, it's not clear, for instance, if um, some of these areas are vegetation or that they're dark. So maybe it's vegetation, maybe it's um, uh, parking lot, very dark, could be an asphalt parking lot. But when we look at the color infrared, we can see some of those dark areas come out as red. So we recognize that those must be grass. Um, interestingly, um, if you look at the area within the stadium, in the color infrared, it doesn't come up red. And that's because this is a um, astroturf surface. Um, deciduous versus coniferous vegetation. Um, so this is an area in South Carolina, and you can see areas that have been planted in pine. 
um, that I'm pointing out is coniferous and uh, areas that are in deciduous broadleaf vegetation, uh, which is the natural vegetation for those areas because of the different reflectance of infrared light. Um, healthy versus stressed vegetation. Uh, if you look in the color image in the, the bottom left, uh, it's very hard to see differences um, between the colors of those crowns. On the right in color infrared, what you see is that um, there are stressed vegetation crowns that are very bright. And what that means is that, um, you know, they're white. That means they're bright in uh, blue, green, um, and on the, on the image, and red, right? So on the image, it's white. Therefore, it's bright in blue, green, and red. Um, and so what that means is that um, there's no contrast between the visible and the near infrared. And so that means probably the pigments from the um, the pigments in the, the leaves of those trees is probably um, uh, is now lost. And so those are probably brown leaves or brown uh, needles. Haze penetration. So um, here we have a color image at top and a color infrared image at the bottom. Um, if you remember from scattering, uh, the biggest source of scattering is Rayleigh scattering, um, and that occurs mostly in the blue. So if you're recording blue, green, and red, as you do in color images, um, you get a lot of scattering in blue, and that leads to um, uh, a lot of haze and low contrast in, in the image. On the bottom, we're not recording blue energy. We're recording um, green, red, and near infrared. So we have some scattering in the green. Um, and so that's being recorded as blue, um, but not nearly as much. And therefore the color infrared image um, is going to have much less haze and better, um, better contrast than in the color image. Um, can fly new photography. Um, these days that's probably going to be digital and not film. Um, and uh, if you're looking at earlier periods, you might want to get historic aerial photo. So um, the most comprehensive source of aerial photography is the USDA Aerial Photography Field Office in uh, Salt Lake City. And it's the primary source for aerial image for images for the USDA. And that's both film and digital. So it's got about 60,000 archive rolls of film from 1955 to the present. That's over 10 million images. And it's um, also got 80 terabytes of digital geospatial data. That's out of date, that number. So it's probably even more now. Um, Pre-1955, um, the, uh, the big early aerial image acquisitions were in 1937 and then in 1941. And in 1941, 90% of U.S. agricultural areas were acquired um, for uh, looking at the impacts of the Dust Bowl. And those films are housed at the National Archives. From 1955 to 1980, um, the film hold, uh, holdings at the APFO include um, the Soil Conservation Service, or prior to that, the Agricultural Stabilization and Conservation Service, uh, more than 23,000 rolls of that at a 1 to 20,000 nominal scale. They've also got about 19,000 rolls of Forest Service um, film for just national forests. Uh, and then that Soil Conservation Service, that's the the later film, and that's about 2,000 rolls of film. Um, two big USGS um, photographic data sets, um, NHAP and NAP. NHAP ran from 1980 to 1989. Um, they covered 48 states, so not Alaska and not Hawaii, uh, every five years. And the coverage varied due to budget um, from year to year. 
they collected 1 to 58,000 color infrared and 1 to 80,000 black and white images. Um, this was at a 40,000 foot flying altitude. So you get about a two meter spatial resolution. Um, NAP was collected from 87 to 2003 and it replaced NAP. Um, again, the USGS coordinated it, 48 states and Hawaii on a five to seven year cycle. Um, and that's at one to 40,000 scale, uh, which is about a meter spatial resolution. After the NAP program, um, the NAIP program began. So that's an annual Coast to Coast um, program. Uh, they don't cover everything every year. Um, they make um, orthophotos out of that. Um, it's available at one meter and two meter resolution. And it's a, a five year cycle for one meter um, base map replacement. It's leaf on and peak growth. Um, and they do it over a very short period so that um, you really get it peak growth no matter whether you're near the start or the end of a given year's collection. You can either get it as full spatial resolution, digital orthophoto quad tiles um, or compressed county mosaics. And so they compress it so you lose um, some of the spectral details that you would want to have for, for instance, um, uh, digital processing, but um, you can um, you can view a large area with relatively small files. Uh, Aronoff reviews high resolution commercial scanning um, of photos, but Honestly, that's very expensive. And um, this table is nice for reference should you need that for when you want to do scanning of, of photos. Um, electronic frame capture systems are replacing or have replaced for the most part, chemical emulsion of uh, uh, photos with a digital sensor. Um, so, they have the same digital qualities, um, I'm sorry, geometric qualities as film um, photos, uh, but they're in a digital form. And one of the nice things is that they're generally flown with uh, a GPS receiver and uh, an inertial measurement system, which determines the orientation of the plane, its roll, pitch, and yaw. You put together the photo, the GPS, and the IMU, and if you have a local DEM, you can create high quality ortho photos in near real time. So uh, this makes it very good for applications in disaster response. Um, just to look at digital sensors, you know, in film, we have these grains of solar halide that are uh, converted to silver or uh, for black and white or replaced by colored dyes during processing. And the smallest unit of spatial resolution is the individual grain. Um, and light that isn't blocked by one color layer is transmitted down into um, subsequent color layers in the film. Um, CCD is uh, the kind of digital technology you have in your, your digital cameras or in your phone. Um, each pixel element can record a, a single signal voltage, uh, depending on the amount of light falling on it. More light, more voltage. Each pixel has a, a single filter that allows either blue, green, or red light in it. So the smallest area that has all three colors is a two by two square grid. Uh, and then, um, Resampling of the image is done so that you get all three colors for each pixel, but it's an approximation. Um, CMOS, um, each pixel creates a voltage depending on the amount of light falling on it, but light can penetrate through layers so that you get all, you get uh, real um, estimates of the brightness of each layer for each pixel. This gives you an idea of how um, 
you go from a CCD uh, uh, grid to uh, a full color image. Um, the pattern that's used on the uh, CCD is called the bear pattern. Okay, so you have incoming light, um, and there are two green pixels for every one blue or red pixel, and that's because your your the rods in your um, in your eye are more sensitive to green, so it's better to have a full um, characterization of green or a fuller characterization of green than red or blue. This then goes through this color interpolation um, um, processing, and the missing colors are filled in from adjacent pixels. As of digital cameras, you have large format uh, digital cameras. Um, some of them use multiple cameras, so it might have um, five, uh, four cameras, panchrom or five, panchromatic, blue, red, green, and near IR. Um, and again, it probably would have higher resolution for panchromatic um, than for color or infrared. Um, you might have a single digital camera with the bear pattern, um, or um, you might have multiple camera design using a single detector per camera. So for instance, you might have four adjacent uh, CCDs with separate filters, and each one will record one color. This will then need to be registered um, uh, one to another spatially. Trade-offs between film and digital images. Um, film and digital imaging require different pre-processing. Digital cameras produce data that can be used in real time. Film products have to be developed. Um, in contrast to Aronoff, automated approaches to stitching um, adjacent digital images together do exist. Um, and then digital images can be checked during flight to assure that the correct areas have been flown and that they're properly um, exposed. Um, digital photos can be turned into ortho photos in a rapid automated process. Digital cameras have greater radi radiometric resolution. So they might have 2000 levels of gray versus uh, 256 more or less for film. And digital cameras can detect a wider spectral range and are more consistent from one acquisition to another. Film has the, still has the potential for higher spatial resolution because of the small size of the silver halide grains and the relative ease of using very large film sizes. Um, so for instance, a, a digital camera would have to have a gigapixel um, resolution to match the resolution of a nine by nine inch photo. Still, it's now more often used by aerial survey uh, farms.